Russia might attack again. Uh, our children will be fighting Russia in the future. He will not attack any NATO country. If you are a fundamentally unserious person, we're heading towards a major global conflict. Ukrainian artillery shell is worth more to Moscow than the life of one or five or ten of its soldiers. Then we will again be brotherhood nations. How far back do you want to go? <laughs> How far back do you want to go? Oh, maybe Ukraine should start peace talks. I, I have no interest in, in, in pursuing a further conversation with you. That Hello, and you are watching and listening to Decoding Ukraine podcast from Ukraine, where we tell you insights, stories that you do not see on the front pages, but that define the further course of this war. And today here with you is me, Maria Avdieva, security analyst and Ukrainian journalist. And Artem Lysak, a Ukrainian journalist covering war from 2014. And we are thrilled to introduce our guest today. This is Oz Katerji. Hello. Thanks uh, for having me. <laughs> uh, Oz is a British Lebanese conflict journalist and filmmaker based in Kyiv. And he's also the director of the Battle for Kyiv, uh, which is his first long documentary. But we will talk about that a little further. And we want to start about the recent events that yeah. happened in Ukraine during this week. Yeah, exactly. Just yesterday, uh, Russia hit Odessa during the time when Zelensky and Greek Prime Minister uh, was there and the missile hit like 500 meters from their convoy. Uh, Oz, what do you think? Uh, is it, do you think Russia is trying to make the stakes higher in this war? And do you think they've made it on purpose because the intelligence definitely knew that uh, Zelensky and Prime Minister, Greek Prime Minister, were in Odessa? And sorry for interrupting, but that was not only this, but also that was the day when uh, Ukraine and Odessa were mourning for people who were killed in the recent uh, strike on that high-rise building in Odessa where five children were killed. And yesterday, uh, Timofey, who was uh, three months old, and his mother, Anna, there was a funeral ceremony for them, which actually Zelensky and uh, Greek Prime Minister were also uh, visiting this the scene of this uh, recent attack. So these two events and then again R Russian missile strike. So what is your take on that? Yes, I, I think Moscow's calculation in this is very much um, that escalation is, is their only real option. I mean, they've, they've required escalation and escalatory rhetoric um, since the beginning of the war, even predating the war. What they're trying to do is intimidate Ukraine's allies. They want to intimidate Ukraine's allies so Ukraine's allies stop supporting Ukraine and force Ukraine to concede territory to Russia. Um, and so far, this tactic has had mixed success. In the beginning uh, of the war, it, it was able to uh, prevent heavy weaponry coming in in those early months in 2022. After a few months, after the summer of 2023, more and more weapons start coming through, the HIMARS systems, then F-16s, then main battle tanks, all of these equipment being at slowly added into Ukraine's arsenal. This is a disaster for Russia, and what Russia wants to do is to prevent these kinds of things from reaching the Ukrainian people. Uh, they are having a huge amount of success. Russia, Russia is having a huge amount of success in America, where they are fostering uh, discontent against Ukraine and the war effort that the US has been funding. There's a block in Congress, thanks to the far right uh, pro-Trump Republicans who seem to have it out for Ukraine and seem to be very, very in favor of Putin personally. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a mixture of escalation and intimidation. Um, at, at no point does the calculation from Moscow appear to be uh, worried that they might cross a line or they might go too far um, and then invite uh, further uh, reaction from the West. That doesn't seem to be in their calculation right now. However, they keep escalating and I don't think they're going to stop. I don't think this is the limits of the escalation. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think people, uh, particularly in the West, should be prepared for uh, Russia to keep throwing absolutely everything it has, everything it has, it is completely pot committed to this war. 
this war is everything. It's the, the survival of the Moscow regime. It's the survival of uh, Russian imperialism in the 21st century. This war has to be won by Russia, as that's how they that's how they view it. So there is nothing they're not willing to do. Uh, otherwise, you know, e even as far as tactical nuclear weapons, um, one could look at the statements that came from China. Um, that seemed to put a, a, a lid on the bottle of uh, nuclear threats. I think Putin knows that even his ally in, in, in Beijing won't support a nuclear strike. Um, but again, I wouldn't put it past this regime. This regime murders women and children as a priority. They're not targeting Ukrainian military facilities. They're targeting bread, bread queues and the residential buildings and schools and hospitals and that's what they've been doing for decades that's the russian way of warfare murdering the most innocent most vulnerable people you could possibly imagine and um they do that to degrade uh the ukrainian will and capacity to fight um i don't think that's going to work i don't think the ukrainians are about to surrender um but that's definitely the kind of pathology in Moscow right now. Yeah, and you you just uh, mentioned that that we have Ukraine have less and less support in U.S. For example, we remember when the war started, we remember how the whole world, uh, how the whole world were supporting Ukraine, and we saw the changes in U.S. Do you feel the same changes are in European Union and in Britain? Um, definitely not in Britain. Um, there also seems to be, I think, I think the, the, the easiest way to understand things for people that probably aren't following the politics of this every day is that the people who are most against Ukraine are those on the very far right and those on the very far left. Um, they both have pro-Russian sympathies in this war. They believe that NATO is the reason, the West is the reason. Whatever Putin says to each different camp, they believe. They believe Ukraine should surrender its territory. They believe, uh, you know, for peace, Ukraine should submit to Russian aggression. There's no nuance that I'm missing out here, and I don't care if people want to argue with me. That's what's happening on the far left, on the far right. In the UK, you know, we had Boris Johnson's people, Dominic Cummings, Jeremy Corbyn and his people, these are on the on the hard right and on the hard left of the British political spectrum. Both of these guys are, are viciously, vigorously campaigning against arming Ukraine. And um, so, yeah, I, in Britain, I can reassure Ukrainian audiences or pro-Ukraine audiences anyway, um, that we are resolutely behind Ukraine. Speaking about funding and economy, uh, David Cameron just said that Britain is prepared to loan Ukraine all frozen Russian central bank assets, and these are billions of um, of euros. Uh, does this make a change? Uh, will Russia ever be pay for what they have done in Ukraine? Well, I mean, look, at the end of the day, Russia has assets in Western countries. And it's my opinion and my belief um, that we should seize those assets and give them directly to Ukraine. Uh, we have the legal and moral right to do that. Um, there are hesitations about doing that, particularly the fear that uh, what kind of precedent this sets um, that I've heard some econo <coughs> economists talking about that I don't agree with, because at the end of the day, if they're worried about the precedent that this sets, don't launch a naked war of aggression against a country because you want to control or take over that country. Don't do that and your assets are going to be safe. Do that and your assets are going to be seized. And I think that that is the right precedent to set. And I also think the conversation uh, in the US and, and the UK with the current Biden administration that we have there anyway, uh, Trump is a different story, we can come to that later. Um, I think the conversation is starting to move in that way. I think the EU are slightly more hesitant to do that than Britain and, and the US. Um, but I, I think we're moving towards that. And also, there is a kind of growing sense of dissatisfaction, as I said, from the far left and the far right. So it's a really trying to pressurize the public into growing against sending money to Ukraine. And that's very very good solution to that problem fine 
we're not sending any taxpayer money. We're sending seized Russian assets. And I think that that's going to be vital, not just for the war effort, but also for the reconstruction at the end. Yeah. There are hundreds of billions of dollars worth of Russian assets around the world that can and should be seized and sent to Ukraine um, as reparations for what Russia's done to this country. Yeah, to give just a understanding uh, uh, about how about what sums of money we are talking about. So the estimate is uh, 100 billion uh, euros a year needed for Ukraine to continue fighting and 50 billion euros needed for restoration a year. That's like a huge amount of money and uh, it's not only Britain but all other countries should reconsider uh, their strategy and see what they can do to help Ukraine continue fighting and rebuilding uh, what was done. But uh, like, let's return back to the situation on the ground. Uh, your documentary is about a battle for Kyiv. Uh, there is now a sense uh, like of threat and some people are talking that Russia might attack again. Uh, do you think that they might try uh, ag again to attack on the direction of Kyiv? How do you see this threat? So it depends on the course of the war. If there are more territorial collapses, uh, like happening in, in Avdivka, um, I think it is worrying. I, I don't think Russia's ambitions in Ukraine have ended. You just had to look at Medvedev's uh speech the other day with the map behind him yeah um russia has territorial ambitions in ukraine that extend far beyond the four oblasts they have tried to uh, illegally annex um and i do think that this is why i'm so opposed to these kinds of discussions about oh we need to get round peace talks and so on because there is no path to peace that involves concessions to Russia. Any concessions to Russia will be the new borders of Russia, and then Russia will send its troops to start building up again. Once it's rebuilt its military strength, it's going to come for the government in Kiev again. 100%, I have no doubt in my mind, that's what they intend to do. So it's about, it's why it's so vital that the support for Ukraine keeps coming in, because this war is not going to end by... Uh, there's not going to be a peace by shaking Putin's hand and giving away uh, four oblasts to, to Russia. But for example, like uh, pro-Trump uh, Republicans, mm -hmm. uh, they are saying, uh, look, Carlson Tucker, he was just recently like uh, having an interview with Putin and he said he will not attack any NATO country. Uh, so he'll do that. What you will answer those people who are saying that, look, Putin I, promised I, 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 If anyone said that to me, I, I would not treat them with respect because there are there are sorry forgive me they're a moron if you believe putin's lies still in 2024 then you are not as you are a fundamentally unserious person that should not be listened to by anyone in any level of political power that's the worrying thing about trump not just that he had particularly after the first impeachment was down to ukraine um i believe Trump is out for revenge against Zelensky and Ukraine personally. Um, so I, I where well, I can say that, yes, I don't think these are fundamentally un serious people. I, I can also say that um, they are still dangerous, very dangerous. Um, and I think uh, going back to an earlier question, uh, Europe and the UK are starting to see that the US is becoming an unreliable partner. Um, and in the worst case scenario, Trump comes in, cuts all aid to Ukraine. You effectively have a pro-Russian president in, in Washington, DC. Uh, I think the Europeans will still continue to, I don't think the Europeans are going to buckle under that pressure because of Trump. I think they will step up further. Will that be enough? That's, that's difficult to say. Um, but yes, I do think the danger and the threat uh, posed to Kyiv is very real. It exists. It will continue to exist for as long as Russia is not defeated in this war. Um, and any territorial concessions will only um, encourage further aggression uh, from Russia. So I think that would be a, f a catastrophic foreign policy disaster if if Ukraine is being forced to uh, sign away its territory. And not only in the Ukrainian context, 
in the wider uh, global context, if a war of aggression against a sovereign state is rewarded with territorial concessions, and when they talk about these, when people talk about these peace talks, they're not just saying Ukraine must give over the territory. They're saying the US, the UK, the EU must recognize and legitimize Russian control. The Russian borders will now be officially accepted by everyone. That's what they're saying in demand for peace. Yeah. What you've effectively done is you've given any dictator who has a nuclear arsenal free license to invade wherever they want, whenever they want, take whatever they want, whenever they want. And that is the new global order. That is the precedent. Everything we had post-World War II will be gone. It will be up in flames because Russia will have set the new world order. And if you think that this is going to stop in with Russia or in Europe, you're wrong. We're heading towards a major global conflict um, because we failed to uphold uh, international norms when we were supposed to. So I think this is a a major risk for Ukraine, for the rest of the world. And I think it's really important that European leaders, uh, Western leaders, South Korea, Japan, countries like this come together and realize what's at stake for liberal democracies around the world if they give in to Russia here in Ukraine. With you, sorry, with your documentary Battle for Kyiv, do you think you like make uh, this message through? Do by doing this documentary and releasing it in this year, the third year of the war, uh, will it tell something new for peace people in the West, for Western leaders, so that they will understand better something? Or? So look, this is this was my first film. So the reason why it's coming out so late is because it took me a long time to. Uh, get people interested in the film who wanted to help me make it and produce it. These kind of things take money. And look, I'm I'm a debut film. I'm a well-known journalist, uh, but I'm not a well-known filmmaker. Yeah. Um, I've made lots of little, you know, five-minute, four-minute films in the past uh, for TV, for broadcast, for Vice, for magazines. Uh, but these kinds of things aren't, you know, proper full-length films. So getting the process towards... Uh, finally producing it took a long time for me and it will take longer still. I, I still don't know exactly when we're going to release because we haven't got a distributor yet. So if you're a distributor and you're interested in my film, <laughs> please do get in touch. And we will put the link uh, for the trailer. Oh, please do. Down. Yeah. yeah, so you can watch um, it. But look, as to your question about the film, the film is really about the story for Kiev. So I arrived in Ukraine on the 14th of February 2022, 10 days before the full-scale invasion. It's my first ever time in Ukraine. Uh, I certainly don't want to ever present myself as some kind of Ukraine expert. I came towards the politics here post-2014. My dan was what made me go, what's happening in Ukraine? I should pay attention to this. Now, I've been reading a lot. Thank you, Serhi Plohi, uh, especially <laughs> yeah, yeah. for right. teaching me yeah. so much <laughs> about this uh, beautiful country that I now call home. Um, but yeah, the story that I tell is about those three months. I came on February the 14th, I was here for 10 days during peacetime, and then I was here for three months during the invasion. And in that time, the Russians invaded, and then they were smashed in Kyiv, and they were pushed out of the north of the country. That all happened in the process of me filming my documentary. So that's the story that we will tell. Um, I also think that, look, there hasn't really been a major Kiev documentary. There was an Israeli documentary that got nominated for the Emmy in 2023. Uh, the crew were only here for about two weeks, I think, in the film. So yeah. uh, Vice did one. They were here for the very beginning. There have been lots of little documentaries done, uh, but no one really has done before the war to after the liberation yeah. in Kiev in one full story yeah, yeah. but what i think it does is still tell the story of the bravery of the people of ukraine the sacrifices they made the heroism required to to push russia out and to win the battle for kiev but also of the horrors that russia left in their wake so whereas i don't think that watching this film will teach you much about what's happening in 2024 i think it will teach you a lot about what the russians were trying to do to this country and you know the war, what russia can do in the yes. future well also since yeah. since since kiev is no longer under threat a lot of people have 
their attention has turned away from Ukraine. Exactly. A lot of people look at the east of Ukraine and say, why should I care about any yeah. of this? Kiev, they can care for. Um, that's not my view. I mean, look, my story is about Kiev, but it places it in the context of this is a war of survival. This is an existential war for the Ukrainian people and uh, and the, the bravery and triumph involved um, for them to get that victory in Kyiv is a story that I think we should be telling our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren. I think this is one of those, you know, like Stalingrad type stories that yeah. uh, that needs to be told for generations because no, no one should ever forget what happened here in Kyiv, what happened in Bucha, in Irpin, in Borodyanka, in Brovary, in all of these places around the outskirts. Um, and as I said in the film, uh, the most important thing that I can say about this is that the defences that the Ukrainians made were never breached. Kyiv, the walls of Kyiv were never breached. Um, the outskirts were, the suburbs were in the oblast. They suffered immensely. Yeah. And but Kyiv stood tall and it, it pushed mm. the Russians out. And I think that, that telling that story is something that I, I want to tell to the world. And if if we if we will compare, I, I remember at the time uh, all Ukrainians were so motivated, uh, like we saw a large queues to uh, recruitment centers uh, in the first months of war. You've been here for two years covering Ukraine. Do you think that the, like this mood changed now? Do you think the people feel exhausted now and are they are not so motivated? And maybe some some of them are telling about, oh, maybe Ukraine should start peace talks. Um, I don't think it's either or. Uh, and in my experience, I've not met any Ukrainians that say we should start peace talks. Yeah. None. I, I'm sure they exist. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm sure they <laughs> yeah. exist, right? But I've never met any of them. Um, and I think that needs to be said. I think that, that when you look at the polling, you're looking at like 91, 92% of people want to fight Russia till the end. Yeah, That's insane. In the West, we have nothing like those kinds of polling on anything. You know, no political issue will get you that kind of 90%, yeah. you know. So, yes, I'm sure there's an 8% of Ukraine, 9% of Ukraine that, that feels uh, like that. Uh, but it's not my experience of, of, of meeting people. And, and, and my anecdotal experience is that these polls are telling the truth. Because now, what the other bits that you said, it's not an either-or situation. Yeah. You can be exhausted by the war. You can still support the war but not want to be drafted yeah. yourself, conscripted yourself. I know there are people fleeing. Not everyone fleeing is is fleeing because they don't support Ukraine's war effort. They are scared, you know, and 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 some people aren't aren't meant to fight. They just, you know, it's it's a very difficult thing. You know, Ukraine is under martial law, um, and you're fighting an existential war for your survival. That requires sacrifice from the entire population, um, and some people don't. That, I mean, that's a very human instinct. It's one that, that I think most people can empathize with. Yeah. But I don't think that, that existing, that exhaustion, that, that fear, people that are tired of, of war, I don't think any of that then necessarily equals to people want to surrender. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think both things can be true. Uh, they still, they feel this way, but they still want to win and they still support Ukraine's victory. These are very complicated things. And I think that people uh, want to try and understand the world in a very black and white way. And the most black and white way of viewing the conflict is if you're in the West, well, the West are, are encouraging this war. Why don't they just why don't they just give give, in, give Russia what it wants and then there's peace? Um, and what people don't understand who have this completely insane view is not just as I said Russia will attack again it's that land doesn't matter it doesn't no one is upset because of you know this part of Kherson or Zaporizhia or whatever this is a war for people it's about people and there are people living in that in that land it's not about 
a hundred miles here or a hundred miles there. It's about people and protecting the Ukrainian people. And everyone knows what life is like under Russian occupation. We've seen it with our own eyes. My film tells that story of what it's like. Uh, Russian occupation is rape, murder, death. That's what Russian occupation is. And that's why this is a war for people, not for land. Uh, and that's why the Ukrainians are fighting for their people, not for some bit of territory that, you know, some Westerner can't pronounce correctly. That's not the point. The point is that uh, without liberation, there can be no survival for Ukraine. And I think that this is not stressed enough when people say, why don't you just give away four oblasts of your territory? Because yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow will be another four oblasts until there's nothing left. Uh, the line must be drawn here this far, yeah. no yeah. further. And even further than Ukraine, it could go... In the Guaranteed. If if, yeah. if 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 Ukraine loses and Putin will, the, the Putin says every day. The Russians say every day that they're fighting a war against NATO and the collective West. If they defeat NATO and the collective West in Ukraine, yeah. what makes you think they'll stop and they won't go for the Baltics and Poland? Yeah. What, I don't understand anyone who's like lulled themselves. Oh, they they can barely win in Ukraine. They definitely won't do that. Well, that's twenty twenty four when you're saying they could barely win when the Ukrainians are still being starved of ammunition and, uh, you know, are losing men and territory in, in a horrible, grinding, attritional war against a much bigger nuclear-armed state. Um, we made obligations to Ukraine uh, in 1992. Yeah. Security obligations that we failed to live up to. Um, Ukraine is not a part of NATO, but we should be taking this much more seriously than... Let's just help the Ukrainians fight. It's much more serious than that. Uh, our children will be fighting Russia in the future if we don't stop this here. It has to stop here. Um, so look, I, I don't want people to come away with a kind of idea from this interview that uh, things are going well and you know they're not. Things are going pretty badly right now <clears throat> and the support is re required. Uh, in the beginning of this war, I always said Ukraine can win this war. But to win that war, it needs to have completely outsourced its war economy to the West. And in 2022, that was happening. In 2023, that started to rupture. And that's a year. A year of full support and then, oh, yeah. that's insane. Uh, people have very short memories um, and, and we can't allow them to forget what happened, what's happening here in Ukraine. In the trailer to your documentary, I saw, you know, uh, and you said that Russian soldiers were going from door to door and that's what have what they have did here in Kiev and in rather in other regions uh, that were occupied and uh, I think this is very important uh, to do this to show documentaries like yours and this is why we are uh, doing this podcast decoding Ukraine to tell uh, people in the West to tell English speaking people about the situation on the ground because for a long time it was considered like a, a stalemate it's not a stalemate as you said that yeah. it's uh, ra uh, just now now uh, Ukrainian uh, military says that Russia is attacking on five directions. Imagine five directions and the front line is 1,100 kilometers long. So and Ukrainian army is running out of ammunition. So they just don't have enough to uh, to fight back. It, it was uh, it goes beyond that, too, because the Russians, they don't care about human life. They don't care about their own people. Russia's a fascist dictatorship. Putin could not give a a dam about the Buryats or uh, the Dagestanis that he's sending to to fight this war. As far as he's concerned, he's concerned, millions of Russian citizens could die as long as he gets part of Ukraine or all of Ukraine. He doesn't care. This is not a man who cares about human life. He's a monster. He's a mass murderer. The Ukrainians don't fight war like this. The Ukrainians are trying to protect their men. Um, they're starved of ammunition and they're trying to protect their men. So when Russia sends wave after wave after wave of conscripted Mobix um, at Ukraine who don't have the ammunition to fight back, that's effectively what the Russians are doing. They are draining Ukraine's ammunition supply by throwing their own men towards the front lines. Um, they don't care how many, you know, uh, Ukrainian artillery shell 
is worth more to Moscow than the life of one or five or ten of its soldiers. Yeah, it's that's that's the calculation they've made. Oh, we'll lose a soldier, and they don't get they don't have an artillery shell. Great, send ten thousand soldiers, send twenty thousand soldiers. Yeah. The scale of the Russian losses are so staggering. This still hasn't filtered through, not to Russia, not to the rest of the world. The Russian losses in Avdivka alone are said to be over ten thousand men. That's an insane amount of men to take take a city that's not a city yeah, anymore. Yeah, with Doesn't a thirty exist. thirty thousand of population, but it's also very interesting. So you said like people have a short memory, but we know that every country they understood that the Putin is a monster, but. How, I don't how, think everyone sees it like that. Uh, how, how, how For a long time, people saw Putin as someone we could work with. Obama. Yeah, but after... Merkel. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, after, come on. Uh, this was when Obama started working with Putin yeah. in Syria after the Assad regime had slaughtered and the Russians had come in and slaughtered and were bombing hospitals daily. And Obama had a constant line yeah. of... Yeah, communication and cooperation agree. with that. Merkel, for years, made uh, Germany reliant on Russian energy. Yeah. The Russians, of course, they thought that, that nothing was going to happen if they invaded Ukraine. Every bit of information they've received from Western leaders over the past however many decades going back is that we will do nothing to prevent you from killing human beings. But after, we'll do nothing about it. Yeah, But after war started, we, we saw what Putin is. And... How, it's, how sorry, it, it's we here in Ukraine. I agree with us here that the people uh, like politicians or someone like this far right and far left people in the West, they still don't get it right. And this is why it's so important to talk about this, because they still like consider some logic. They think that what Putin or what Russia does has some logic. No, it doesn't have. Yeah. There's like a perverse uh, just will to conquer more. That's, yeah. that's if it. you if you think people like Mir Shima are just sort of on the fringes and no one listens to them and whatever, you're wrong. People do listen to to people like him. Doesn't matter how insane he is, how obsequious and bootlicking he is towards Russian fascism. Um, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, John Mearsheimer is an apologist for Russian fascism. Uh, but lots of people take him seriously. And when he says Putin's not an imperialist, this is all about NATO. If we want to, if you don't want war, NATO should have disbanded after yeah. the war. You know, it's just... But whoa, 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 we understand that rubbish, it's, it's Russian you know? propaganda. How it's reached uh, U.S. Congress? How it's reached like a lot of politicians in the West? How so it's happened? Some some people, lots of people, even have sympathies with fascism. It is not. I don't think that, we're, especially not Ukraine. I don't think Ukrainians should be surprised, uh, given what the 20th century was like, uh, to find out that some people really like authoritarian, totalitarian rulers. They they are comfortable with mass murder. They are comfortable with using your military force to to rape and pillage. This is not something that bothers everyone. I know it should do, and you think, what? Yeah, but look at the actual evidence. Look at the evidence for how Putin is still viewed in some parts of the world. Yeah, look, Russia look is at, still look member of the European. Sorry, Russia is still the member at the UN Security Council. Yeah. is it like look, is look there at, a logic look, here? Look at look at the South Africans or the Brazilians. Yeah, who and the South Africans and the Brazilians are very very vocal on what's happening in Gaza, and I agree with them. What's happening in Gaza is a fucking disgrace. Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. Yeah. It it's it's appalling. It's mass murder on an industrial scale. That's what the Israelis are doing in Gaza right now. The Brazilians and the South African government can see that and they can recognize that, but they look at what's happening in Ukraine, they look at the mass graves in Butcher, they don't see them. They look right through them. Um, and, and I think that should tell you what kind of governments that Brazil and, and South Africa currently has. It, it, this is not a, these are not governments that are serious about human rights. These are hypocrites. They see Russia as their ally, they support whatever their ally does. They see uh, Israel as their enemy and they oppose whatever. If the situation was flipped and they were allies with Israel, they'd be supporting whatever Israel was doing and opposing Russia. These people are not uh, acting out of moral, you know, they're not they're not acting out of a moral sense of justice here. They're acting out of, you know, real politic or, or, or whatever you want to call it. These are cynical, hypocritical people who don't see the equality and value in all human life. 
right. So speaking about justice, uh, will we ever uh, make Russia pay for what they have done uh, in uh, around Kyiv, uh, around Kherson, uh, what Russia is now doing in other occupied areas where people are living under occupation for more than two years now? I mean, I think we're still waiting for Russia to pay for the Holodomor. We're still waiting for Russia to pay for Stalin's purges. We're still waiting for Russia to pay for Afghanistan. We're still waiting for Russia to pay for Chechnya, for Georgia, for Moldova, <laughs> you know, for 2014. We've been waiting for many generations for Russia to pay for uh, its legacy of imperialism and rape and theft and mass murder. And Russia's never paid for any of these things, ever. So it also means that the, the, the case not only in Putin. No, 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 no. Russia stands condemned. This isn't... Putin is a, a big part of why this is happening, but this has been going on for generations. Generations of, of Russian violence, Russian imperial violence. Many people can point to decades of US imperial violence in Latin America, for example. Right, great, yes, I agree. But Russia gets a free pass for all of this. Russia doesn't even get to be considered an imperial state post the Bolshevik re revolution. I mean, the Bolshevik coup, should I say, wasn't even a revolution. Uh, again, history likes to uh, rewrite itself in order to make Russia seem like, um, you know, not a monstrous evil. Um, again, it's, I'm not talking about Russian people here. I'm talking about the Russian state system, uh, which has never been a democracy. Russia's never been a democracy. The Russian people have never had a democratic right to vote for uh, the person that they think will best serve their interests. Um, so again, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like I'm anti-Russian. I'm not. I am anti whatever Moscow's regime is and has been going back before my dad, before my granddad. Before, how far back do you want to go? How far back do you want to go? Do We can go all the way back. Is, you know? is it possible it will change, do you think? Only the if, system. Only, only if Russia is defeated. Militarily, a, militarily defeated. Right. Ru Russia, need, Russia needs to learn that it has lost a defeat so catastrophic that every person, every person from every corner of that country knows that they have been, they have lost. Like the Germans lost in World War II. There is no German that walks around thinking the Nazis are, are the victors. That's the kind of defeat that needs to be imposed on Russia for any kind of change of system. Even then, I'm not so certain, you know. I saw what happened in 2014 in Ukraine. I saw the revolution of dignity. People were shot dead in the streets protesting for their democratic rights and freedoms. And until Russians are willing to do that en masse, um, I don't think we should even be having a conversation about what will Russia be like. Because so, there's no yeah. point, there's no room for that conversation while the Russian people are not willing to uh, take up arms against their government. And that, that's, that's, what, that's, that's, that's the truth here. If you don't take up arms against a violent fascist dictatorship that rules over you and kills innocent people abroad, I, I have no interest in, in, in pursuing a further conversation with you. That, that's a great point because uh, like what murder of Navalny has shown and like all this discussion was again brought to the table when uh, like uh, Ukrainians, uh, how they say it, uh, they uh, look skeptically, uh, to, put, to put it mildly, uh, on the uh, Russian opposition. It's because Russian opposition, uh, they are always want Ukrainians to resolve their problems. So that's look, always... I on the agenda i have a lot of sympathy for uh the ukrainian view of navalny <laughs> I, i i get shouted at by ukrainian followers uh, sometimes because i i don't necessarily have the exact same view of navalny now navalny is not someone that i consider to be uh you know this really incredible liberal guy um he was a nationalist that had some views that were really bad yeah but he also did seem to disavow those views and start changing his position. 
I'm not here to argue with Ukrainians that they should be supportive of Navalny. I fully understand and empathize why they aren't, particularly the way that you describe it. It's not just Navalny, it's the symptom of uh, Russian opposition. I was having an argument with a, uh, a guy the other day who was talking to me about uh, Boris, I can't pronounce his name. Nemtsov. Who's, no, not Nemtsov, ah. uh, Kogarlitsky, uh, Russian socialist opposite. Mm. Ah, okay. But he's been sentenced to five five years in prison mm. uh, for opposing the war in Ukraine. But in 2014, he was justifying the annexation of Crimea. He like, wasn't, like yeah. a lot of yeah, them. Yeah, he wasn't. He yeah. wasn't opposing the war yeah, in Ukraine. Yeah. He was writing off the Ukrainian government as fascists. Yeah. He was saying that NATO is responsible and that Crimea is Russian and the people want to be Russian and and what Russia did is is justified. So, so it's it's sad that that he's now in prison for five years for opposing the war. But I'm not going to praise him for opposing the war that he supported ten years ago. The reason the war happened today yeah. is because of people like him ten years ago exactly. who didn't who didn't react to topple the regime after after that happened. So, look again. I'm not here to speak in 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 defence of Navalny, particularly to my Ukrainian audience who justifiably have very strong views about him. But what I will say about Navalny is he didn't have to go back to Russia. He went back to Russia facing near certain death, certain death, and he was murdered for it. And I think if there were more Navalny's in Russia, that maybe we could start having the conversation about what will Russia look like in the future. Until then, I don't see many Russians who have the the courage and the will to fight back against the regime that Navalny had and until they do until people are willing to take it, they, Navalny's not the only one Boris Nemtsov is an uh, is another one there are there were many people uh, Vladimir uh, Karamurza he's in prison yeah. there are many many Russians uh, Russian friends of mine there are many many Russians I know who are extremely against the regime and who have suffered immensely for doing so the problem is they are in the minority of the minority. I think we should celebrate them and defend them and support them. Uh, but at the end of the day, they are in the minority of the minority. And look, it's difficult to topple a fascist totalitarian dictatorship that's willing to kill you and your family for speaking out. It's dif difficult and terrifying. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, that it shouldn't be done either. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you have to, to stand up for for what's right even if it costs you everything and it's very easy for me to say that as a you know as a journalist as someone who who hasn't participated in a revolution myself but um, at the end of the day the cost of not doing this is mass murder yeah. it's as simple as that and uh the, the, would you rather fight and stand up against mass murder or are you willing to just tacitly accept it and and, and just protect you and yours and that again, that's a very human, a human response that I can understand and empathize with. But the future of Russia relies on a total revolution. And unless that happens, there's not going to be any kind of room for democratic discussions or even further, you know, Ukrainian Russian relations in the future. I mean, these are, this is an absurd, an absurd thing to talk about yeah. right now. But if you want to start talking about peace deals, how it's absurd to talk about this but you're pushing peace negotiations when russia won't even c admit that it slaughtered people yeah door to door in butcher and threw them in a mass grave russia won't even admit that it did that yeah. what kind of what, what kind of negotiations or or or, or uh, reconciliation can there be with with your rapist and murderer it just i'm sorry it's it's absurd. It needs to be pushed back on, um, and uh, and yeah. And I again, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate what I said before. It's not on Ukrainian people to solve Russia's problems. That's on the Russian people. Exactly. I had uh, before the full-scale invasion. I had a, a, a conversation with a Russian, uh, quite well-known uh, opposition leader, uh, not Navalny, but the, the other one, uh, and uh, he was saying to me that after. Uh, we put down uh, the Putin regime with the help of Ukrainians, like meaning that Ukrainians will be part of this movement. Then we will again be brotherhood nations and we will, you know, together we 
with you build a new world and i said no 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 stop here we want to be independent free country part of the european union part of nato we feel ourselves part of the western community we do not want to be any kind of any part of russian world we do not want to build any kind of like closer relations leave us alone build, build your own country do whatever you want in your country do not like mess with our uh, internal affairs stop right there on the border now i think this is probably what's going to be the most defining legacy of what putin did in ukraine it's not going to be um you know at some point this war's going to end at some point there's going to be there's going to be a post war future but and i know from speaking to ukrainians and from reading the work of trusted ukrainian historians that the ukrainian national identity didn't always exist in the way it does now and the one thing that russia has done indisputably is create a ukrainian national identity that cannot be broken we're never going to go back to a, a point in history where ukrainians view themselves as russians yeah and so, uh, some some might don't get me wrong yeah. i'm not saying speaking for everyone here but but that's never happening again the ukrainian people have divorced themselves mentally spiritually from russia there's no way to undo that there's yeah. no way to undo uh, a national identity being birthed this national identity is permanent now ukrainian national identity existed long before russia yeah. existed yeah, so i don't exactly. i don't want to make it sound <laughs> yeah. like i yeah. but i'm saying that it wasn't always so a view so widely shared yeah. particularly after the soviet union you know even after the holodomor there were still a lot of people that were very very sympathetic towards even putin's russia not necessarily the soviet union this is view is in the minority of the minority now here in ukraine ukrainians widely see themselves as ukrainian even ukrainians that don't speak ukrainian who only speak russian have a ukrainian national identity that they believe in um, yeah, and russia reached the opposite they wanted it's a great point that you that about the uh, ukrainians uh, identity being more visible inside ukraine and also for other countries because i've heard it from like germans for for example that before russia invaded they were seeing ukraine very differently probably sometimes not even paying attention and now you cannot do it backwards yeah. so now everyone knows that what ukraine is And your, your your Eurovision entry last year was a, 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 a someone who came here as a student from African heritage and who became a Ukrainian citizen. So yeah. I mean I think that the, these are the these are kinds of things that happened that are very normal in Europe. You know, if so, if that happened in France or Germany, no one would go, oh wow. But it happens in Ukraine, people go, oh wow, a, a black guy sitting for Ukraine. They're like, well, I didn't, you know. And I'm like, it's because you have a fun, an under an idea of Eastern Europe that is not aligned with the reality of what eastern europe is like to live in kiev is a metropolitan city like any other in in yeah. in, in 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 europe it really is and and i think that a lot of people um they still have this kind of uh you know what's the word, right word for it not xenophobic but just kind of just this sort of bigoted view of of, of eastern europeans as being insular you know racist you know and it's 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 wrong it's not it's not borne out in reality and i think that needs to be challenged to address our viewers and listeners uh, who sometimes say that the war in ukraine is already happening uh, for uh, two years now and that's the third year and they are somehow tired of listening and reading about the war in ukraine all the time uh, in your uh, recent piece on uh, the foreign affairs you wrote that uh, everything now points to a long war in ukraine so how long uh, will this war be yeah it was uh, my piece in foreign policy um i i i'm not a, 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 a I don't have a magic ball. <laughs> I don't have a, a view, a, a, few, a way of reading the future. The reason why my piece said Ukraine must prepare for a long war is that the political mood in the US is very bad right now. Uh, there is a real danger of a Trump presidency. And it, if Trump wins, I think he will try and 
punish Ukraine. And Ukraine will then be fighting a war for however many years throughout a Trump presidency. I don't think Ukraine's going to lose a war during a Trump presidency. I think they could suffer greatly and they could lose lots of ground. But I think the war will continue. And I think this is the, that's the point I'm trying to stress to people is part of the idea that, as I said, the far left and the far right believe that the war is being fueled by Western armaments rather than Ukraine's just being supported. But Ukraine will continue to fight whether it's receiving Western armaments or not. It's been a year, over a year, since Ukraine last received a major aid package from the United States. Yeah. It's resulted in ammunition shortages. It's resulted in territorial defeats. Has any of that pushed Ukraine to the negotiating table? No. Ukrainians know what they're fighting for. The idea that simply you know, tying Ukraine's hands behind its back will result in Ukraine negotiating, it's not true. It's just not true. The Ukrainians will fight because it's an existential fight for them. If yeah. they do not win, there is no Ukraine. So they're not going to surrender. It doesn't matter whether the West supports them or not to the question of whether they're going to continue to fight or not. So my prediction of a long war uh, is not is not some sort of, you know, psychic uh, pronouncement of the future. It's looking at the political situation in the West and seeing that the large, large, large sums of money and material that Ukraine needs to win this war may not be forthcoming uh, at all. <laughs> you might be cut off. Um, and I, 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 the reason why I wrote that article is because I want the Ukrainian government and the Europeans in particular, including my country in that, uh, to be aware that, that Russia, uh, that America could turn against Ukraine under Trump and that if they want, if they don't want to be fighting a war, a NATO war in the Baltics or Poland uh, in five, six years time, uh, that they need to step up and uh, provide Ukraine with what it needs to win the war, uh, even in a situation where they're doing so uh, alone. So Ukrainians will continue fighting and we will continue covering this war for you. Uh, please uh, subscribe to Decoding Ukraine. Share this piece, write in the comments what else would you like to know, uh, what insights would you like to know about Ukraine. And uh, this was me, Maria Avdeyeva. Uh, uh, and Artem Lysak. And Hi, yeah, I just want to leave everyone on, on one final note, and that's... Um, Winston Churchill, one of his famous speeches, uh, he said a couple of lines. Um, he said, we'll fight this war if necessary for years and if necessary alone. And I think the Ukrainians are of that mindset too. And um, I, if I could speak to people back home, let's not let them fight this war alone. Okay, they, don't, we, they need our support and we should be providing it. That was our brilliant guest, uh, Oz Ketterji. Thanks for having me. Who will soon release his long documentary on Battle Point for Kyiv and uh, who is covering this war also for you. And uh, please subscribe for his Twitter account. Uh, we will put it also down in the uh, description and follow us and see you. Slava Ukraini. <laughs> see you guys. Eroyam Slava. Eroyam Slava. That was just Good. brilliant.